Hi, this is Christina West, An Artist's Life. Today's podcast is going to be about art and healing. And that is a vast topic. Today I want to talk about something that was a personal experience for me and how that relates to art and healing. The year was 1987. I was just divorced. And a friend of mine contacted me who I adored. He had moved to New Orleans, of all places. And he kept after me to come and uh, live with him and to, you know, have a different kind of life. And I was very interested, and that's exactly what I did. So I really didn't have any agenda going. I didn't have any plans. So I got a little U-Haul that attached to my Subaru, and I <laughs> traveled three days and three nights uh, to New Orleans, and um, I do remember what I learned uh, during that trip, which was the sun did rise, the sun did set, but I ain't out at Texas yet. <laughs> God. At any rate, I took my paintings and a commission piece that he had commissioned for me of himself in a Mardi Gras costume. And I arrived in New Orleans, and he was a director of a wonderful gallery on the Rue Royale. And he knew everybody, of course, because everybody knows everybody when you're working um, Rue Royale, because you're all talking to each other. And today, it, all these memories came back today, because today's Mardi Gras. It's the beginning of Carnival. And I posted an image that I had found in my photos because I'm updating my website. And suddenly, the whole crew that I worked with, you know, contacted me. That's one of the beauties of Facebook. And I haven't talked to these people since 1987, 88. And it brought back all the members of, of New Orleans, hence the podcast. So Tom, Tommy got me a job at the... Uh, up the street, and the director there took a chance on me. I didn't know anything about art. It sold um, art that, what what do we call, upwardly mobile. We also sold Leroy Neiman, uh, pardon my humor, and uh, Erte were some of the ones. We also had a fabulous New Orleans artist, Adrian Deckbar, and more la- more about that later. So I was landed in the art gallery industry. I became an art consultant. And as everybody knows, whenever you start a job, you have to understand what, pro- what the product is. And there were, I can't remember how many artists, 15, 36, I don't know. But you had to learn all the artists' names. You had to learn their background. You had to learn their painting style. You had to learn... Uh, what it was they they created was it original paintings only was it silk screen prints you had to learn the pre-publication price you had to learn their background so it was a lot of material to learn which i'm sure you know goes along with a number of jobs but that that isn't the only thing you had to learn you had to learn to uh stand up and greet whoever came in and you had rotating um you know, number one position, anybody behind the desk, because it's how you made money. You made money as a draw against commission. Can you believe it? So I got $1,000 a month, but if I didn't sell in my fourth month, you got a three-month training program. In my fourth month, if I didn't sell $10,000 worth of art, I owed the gallery. (laughs) Fear-based selling. I know all about it. Okay, so that's that's uh, the uh, setup. So behind the desk, there's number one, two, three, four. In order, you always rotate because you you have to work the customers, work the floor, and sell the product. And so you had to learn to qualify the people coming through the door. And I knew from nothing, right? But these people understood fashion. They understood you know, what kind of shoes they're wearing, the Rolex watches, the whole deal. 
So every time you worked the floor, you got a card with your customer's name and address and phone number, and that's how you built up your customer base, and it's the only way you sold. So it was very important, this meet and greet at the front door. I learned so much that first year that I think it was a destiny piece for me because it was exhilarating. It was uh, sometimes boring. It was so unexpected to be sort of thrown into a group of people you didn't know. We also uh, were known for closing the most sales on the phone. And uh, we say we give good phone, uh, which, you know, it's Nolan's Dolan. So we had a back room, and we had desks, one next to each other, and then desks facing you. And people were just calling their, their clients, because you had to build up clients from work on the floor. And you call them and basically learn to sell over the phone. So I, I did nothing my first three months. It, I was like, oh, God. I didn't have a clue. I was raised sort of in a spiritual family. Money wasn't money you just made. If you could, that's great. But, you know, the focus was spirituality. So I, I, was, I was absolutely clueless. All right, so the month three, they decided to... <laughs> Oh my God! Close the gallery and teach us how to sell, and they got uh, the guys from Est. You know the uh, it's a new name now, but it's that California guru kind of thing. Like you can't if you're you know if you're in a group you can't get up and pee, you know that kind of thing. I mean it's sort of mind control. And I know I have friends who adore it and say it changed their life, but I, I the jury's out for me. I like free will, and I like people coming to conclusions of their own healing through the kind of work that I do, not uh, programmed punishment. So they, uh, this gallery had closed all the galleries, took all the directors from all six or seven galleries, and they gave them S training, which they were going to then go back to their little pods <laughs> and teach all of us. And they did. They got some guy. I don't know if he was an S guy or a closer, but he was uh, considered a brilliant closer. That's the first time I had heard the word. So I was like 29 years old and clueless, you know, 29 and clueless. So he did. Uh, they closed the gallery, and for three days we were taught how to manipulate people to sell a product. Now, just as a little aside, I was so naive. I was so innocent. I was so in love with art and the world of art and myths and fairy tales and legends and the greatness of artists. And each artist has their own separate dreams and themes. I was just Pollyanna. And this broke me. Within a year, this experience broke me. And I think it was necessary because my whole life has been about art. So right at the beginning, you know, I, I uh, you know, the horse hoof hits the gate top and, you know, you fall. So I did, in my fourth month, I did, what did I do? Thirty-five. I sold thirty-five thousand dollars worth of art, and and I, you know, I got ten percent commission from that. And every month, you know, I, I sold about that or more. And some months, you know, ten, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, and you're making a ten percent commission. But I. Internally, I was dying. I was absolutely crushed. My little spirit, you know, my little Pollyanna spirit, everybody's good. Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz, you know, everybody's fine. You know, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Oh, I don't know. I'm not any witch at all. It's, 
I just didn't know who I was. So this was a like a hammer coming down from the materialistic world of business and finance and manipulation. And within a year, I learned that it wasn't about the art. It was about how to sell a fantasy about the art. Especially it was based on, wait for it, investment. (laughs) Ah, This is going to go up in value within a few years, and you will have come in at the pre-pub price, which is only $1,500. And in a couple of years, you won't be able to touch this under 7000 So this is the time to buy. So I was good at it. You know, we learned to adapt. And as, you know, sort of a clown person, I love, you know, theater, acting, physical theater, installation art, that kind of thing. And I was clueless about that, too, at the time. But I learned how to close the deal. And I, you want to know the secret? I know, I know you all want to know the secret. And it works. Maybe I won't tell you. Maybe I'll say it later. <laughs> so the topic is art and healing. Let's get back to that. I know I'm going to leave you all hanging there. I, I ended that year by coming back and to Los Angeles and working for a gallery on, I, I, wait for it, Rodeo Drive. Yes, indeed. And worked a show with Jimmy Stewart when the last, you know, he was, he was in his later years with all the paparazzi out there and a big movie star that you'd all know came in and was giving me the eye. I was like out of my body, like, <laughs> what's happening? And I went to another gallery up north because I wanted to get out of L.A. desperately. And it was a New Age gallery selling New Age art. And I'm talking 150000 80000 25000 Beautiful, gorgeous spiritual art. So I had this, I had both sides of art within this financial forum, and it was a great teaching experience. So I had a movie star come in there. It was, uh, you know, Sonoma, Napa, Sonoma, Mendocino area. The gallery is no longer there. And I sold her $22,000 worth of art. (laughs) And because of that, I got fired the next day. Because the gal who was, you know, my director, who didn't know anything about art at all, while I was actually qualified as an art consultant, was jealous. So that was the end of that story. But that was the end of art gallery, art consultant. I I worked for a lot of years as a making frames in a frame shop for museum framing. And that was far less stress and less money. But so my life has really been in the arts. So now we're going to talk about the healing aspect. One of the things that many people do is, uh, you know, because we, we're all subjective, I like this, I don't like that, is that art is good or bad, according to me. You know, according to moi, that's good art, that's bad art. Well, I did that too. I thought spiritual art was better art than non-spiritual art. I thought figurative art was better than abstract. You know, we all have whatever it is. All that's completely changed now, but... um, One of the things I realized now, later in life, after a lifetime of being on the periphery of the arts, because I chose never to go into the art world after that experience. I didn't want to do shows. I didn't want to be judged. I didn't want to, you know, habba-wabba-dabba, get there, be promoted. It just wasn't real. 
And it's like I got to look behind, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I got to see what the deal was. And also my friend was a director of an art gallery, much better gallery, not so um, upwardly mobile. It was, you know, real content, real artists. Well, maybe, you know. And that's, of course, my idea of them. But, you know, bronze and some beautiful, some old, uh, you know, impressionists that they could afford and, you know, artists that had some sort of merit other than the, what I would call the gallery that I sold was uh, commercial art. Um, sold as real art, as like committed. Now, they're still artists. Those artists are still out there and they're really good artists, but they're making art for a product they want to sell. And it's if they hit a style, they've stayed in that style. So I just looked them up this week because of the Mardi Gras aspect, and I'm remembering all this. They're still painting the same way they were in 1987. I mean, ah. Uh, at JFK University which was a program that is no longer going on, I'm sorry to say. But the focus was how do artists transform not only themselves, but, you know, the, the town in which they live, how do they transform the world? And it was a smorgasbord of unbelievable, wonderful ways in which men and women were delving into the community, working their creative paths to uh, promote, to, to research, to teach, to bring to communities art on all kinds of levels. Briefly, I'll tell you one briefly before the story I'm going to launch into. There was a underpass, you know, where a lot of drugs were sold. And it just had a terrible energy, you know, urine, dark. And and there, this, this one guy decided uh, that he was going to do an uh, art project there. He was one of the students at JFK. And he photographed it and videotaped the area. And then he did a painting, and he got, had to get permission. He had to go through city council. He had to get it approved. This was a, a big deal. It's like Christo, you know, part of what he feels his art is, is all the preparation, all those years and months of getting, uh, you know, approval for, from the city, the states, the wada wada, so he can just start the project. And he feels that's part of the artistic process. So this guy had to do that, too. He did get approval, and one weekend he did a painting at this apex of the underpass, and the painting was of a of a of a saint or a guru. It was an Eastern saint, and it wasn't Buddha. I don't think it was a saint, and but it was beautiful. It you know it was painted in whites and pinks and. And it changed the energy, changed the atmosphere. So what he did, his project was to tape this scenario from the beginning when it was just a dirty, filthy underpass. And, you know, he had taken photos of drug deals there because he wanted to show, as it was part of his project, you know, the whole linear, how it, does it change, will it change, what's going to happen. And sure enough, over time, and within a short time, like two months, that drug dealers didn't meet there any longer. There was no, it just sort of disappeared. It dissipated. Now, I'm not saying that um, drug dealers didn't go somewhere else, because they probably did, but this is how artists can change an atmosphere, change an area, and especially with intent. And he didn't know that was going to happen. He was the question, which is marvelous when artists just ask questions, is what will happen if I do this? Let's watch what will happen. And it was really remarkable. And 
within a year, he did an update a year later or two years later, I think just before he graduated. And that area is still fine. People do not linger. There's, it's a beautiful, this is art and healing. This is how art can bring healing to an area that lacks a certain integrity. Now, I'm, my, I'm figuring my audience is, you know, not indigenous people. Indigenous people, this is like, oh my God, this is like 101, you know. This is inherent in being raised with, in a culturally diverse indigenous traditions. Of course, if you bring something, a sacred aspect of art to an area, it'll change it. But, you know, people in the West, they have to be, it has to be proven scientifically. And this is what the guy did. He was probably a devotee of this guru, whoever it was. And he loved him, and that goes into that painting as well. And that is also very important. Because I, the question is, if you are unconnected and you did that project, but you didn't really care, but you thought it would look good on your, you know, your degree, would it the same thing have happened? That's a good question. So you could set up, you know, two of those projects. At any rate, that student, no, hardly anybody knows. He's not advocated as some great wahoo. He didn't get paid for it. He's not being sold at pre-publication prices. He's not being modeled to become somebody. He was just a normal human being who had an idea, and he did it. Instead of just, we all have a lot of ideas, but it's taking it into action, or Buddha would say, you know, right action. And it changed, and it healed that space. So that's just a precursor to the next story, which I'm going to talk about. But I just want you to see the sort of teeter-totter of of the, you know, the financial art world, you know. Can you imagine Van Gogh, Van Gogh? I mean, bazillion dollars his paintings are going for, and they crucified him. They jeered at him. Oh, it's just, oh, it's very, very difficult for anybody who's got any kind of soul to go, oh, how, how wonderful, you sold it for $22 billion to whoever. So it can hang in their personal mansion. It's just that kind of art, Van Gogh and, you know, the masters, should be hanging in schools. They should be hanging in, in children's hospitals. They should be hanging in hospitals. That's where the energy is needed, not for the super wealthy. I'm sorry. I just don't buy it. I think we've been, you know formulated to buy this sort of program. At any rate, it was, uh, you know, 9-11 happened, and there I was, finally, in a private school, living on student loans, and 9-11 happens. And, you know, it just seemed pointless. What we were doing seemed pointless to look at devastation on this kind of scale and the first real attack on America ever. And I'm not going into the politics of it. I was so distraught. And as a precognitive dreamer, because I am also a dream teacher, I was actually dreaming of the event when my roommate woke me up. And it was just like walking out of dream space into, you know, so-called waking life, having the same dream, because I was looking, I was looking at it. I was watching it happen. So the next podcast is going to be about the second chapter to this will be art and healing. And I'm going to close there for now and just want you to consider these two polar opposites of this art market, the financial underpinnings of the art market in America, at least, and art and healing as a concept. And what would you think art and healing looks like? What do you think 
how would you bring healing into your creative art? If you're a writer, if you're a dancer, if you're a you know, performance artist, if you're a painter, if you're a weaver, if you're a craftsperson, if you do collage, you know, through my study with shamans and indigenous people, there is a very different story about how art can heal people. And within the three-year training that, that I did with uh, marvelous folks from all over the world, you know, with Michael Harner, was a tremendous initiation into the real world of what healing means. What does healing mean? So with that, I'm going to leave this um, podcast at about 30 minutes, and uh, I'll start the second one so we get the story, uh, the second story around art and healing. But this is a vast talk, but, and one that I've spent my entire life on. So I have years and years and years of it. So adios, check out anartistlife.com. And there is an S in that, an artist's life, because we're all artists. And it's a place for artists to gather, get some classes, do some consulting. And I'd love it if you'd sign up, because I have uh, some marvelous classes I'm going to be offering very soon. And I'd love to send you an email about it. All right, this is Christina West and Artist Life.